the Chinese have uh, been undertaking a creeping invasion of the South China Sea. They do it, they're doing it slowly so it will not trigger a war. It will not trigger a retaliation from the U.S. or from other powers in the regions. China is actually waiting for other countries to make a little mistake and then counter with a huge reply and grab the territory. But that is a tactical yes. action. Yes. If you look at the long-term strategic uh, yeah. action of China, you know that they are out to control the entire South China Sea. I call it an intergenerational struggle. We, this generation must lay down the foundation. We must get a ruling striking down the, the nine dash lines and the, the next generation will campaign uh, with the world and uh, to convince China. Well, uh, I think I'm confident that the tribunal will declare the nine dash lines void because if they don't declare the nine dash lines uh, void, the law of the sea will die. We have to know the basic issues, to know that we are supported by international law here, that we are the victim here. Hello and welcome. We're sitting at the Philippine Supreme Court with Senior Justice Antonio Carpio to speak about a topic that he has long focused on, the South China Sea. Thank you for this interview. Let's focus on the South China Sea. I mean, for a long time, analysts have said that this is a global flashpoint. What's changed? Two things. First, in November 2012, uh, China seized Scarborough Shoal. And that was... Uh, a big blow to the Philippines because uh, even in our baselines law, Scarborough Shoal is expressly specified as a Philippine territory. Then you have now the sudden uh, reclamations of China, and this has really gotten the attention of the entire world because China is uh, reclaiming from submerged areas and creating islands and saying that uh, these islands, artificial islands, have territorial sea, territorial airspace, and it's all contrary to UNCLOS. It's uh, against the freedom of navigation that the U.S. has long espoused. And of course, China is doing this uh, in our, within our exclusive economic zone. Uh, like Mischief Reef, it's a totally submerged area at, uh, at uh, high tide but China has reclaimed it and claims it's their island and uh, it's claiming a territorial sea, territorial airspace over it. But under UNCLOS, uh, only the coastal state can create artificial islands out of submerged areas. And uh, Mischief Reef is a submerged area at high tide within our exclusive economic zone. It's just uh, 125 nautical miles from Palawan. and. Uh, they are probably reclaiming about at least 500 hectares out of Mischief Reef. And Mischief Reef is between Palawan and the Spratlys, so our naval commanders are really worried that uh, with an air base and a naval base in, the, in Mischief Reef, with, uh, with thousands of Chinese troops garrison there, we will have a difficult time resupplying our troops in the islands that we hold, we occupy in the Spratlys. So th th this is a big worry. Remember, China seized Mischief Reef in 1995. Yes. And we were wondering why, what will China do with a, with a fully submerged uh, area at high tide. But looking back now, it is a very strategic move of China. So this is also something that analysts around the world have looked at, that China yeah. has, seems to have been moving very strategically, and Xi Jinping now seems even bent on pushing it further forward. The, some people have called it the salami slicing or the cabbage strategy. Can you explain yes, uh, that? Well, uh, the Chinese have uh, been undertaking a creeping invasion of the South China Sea. They do it, they're doing it slowly so it will not trigger a war. It will not trigger a retaliation from the U.S. or from other powers in the region. So they're, 
they're doing it incrementally at a very slow space before, but now it's do they're doing it rapidly. But uh, they're doing it in such a way that it will not trigger a war. Right. So, uh, and they have been very successful in this. China has really moved its defense perimeter from Hainan in 1946 to very close to us, Mischief Reef, Scarborough Shoal, right. and in uh, Malaysia, in uh, Lukunya Shoals. So, and sorry, so what we've seen is that both Mischief Reef and then and, and, and Scarborough Shoal were, were tactical mistakes on the Filipino side. Well, uh, when we, uh, in 1995, when China seized Mischief Reef, China was not yet a member of UNCLOS. UNCLOS. And we'll go and, to that uh, after. So we tried to, uh, to, co to publicize the seizure. We talked to ASEAN and ASEAN, and because of that, there was the ASEAN-China Declaration of Conduct. That was a product. Correct. We wanted to follow the diplomatic track. And uh, the ASEAN Code of uh, Declaration of Conduct should have produced a code of conduct to regulate the behavior of all the coastal states so that there will be no shooting war. Right. But uh, it hasn't happened. It hasn't happened because China has been dragging its feet. So, 1990, 1995, we, uh, we couldn't file a case because. China was not yet a member. It was a member of, became a, it ratified UNCLOS a year later. Now, and we, we believe that we could talk to China, that uh, China's rise was peaceful as uh, they have proclaimed. But then they seized again Scarborough Shore. Correct. But Scarborough Shore is not a submerged area. It's, it's uh, above water at high tide, and our baselines law specifically provides that Scarborough Shore is part of Philippine territory. So, but then we had no Navy, we had no Air Force to evict the Chinese. And our only response was to file. To file a case. A case, the... because we realized that we cannot uh, engage and defeat China militarily, economically, politically, or diplomatically. The only forum where we can, uh, we can uh, beat China, we can assert our rights, is the legal forum, and that's the UNCLOS Tribunal. Because in the UNCLOS Tribunal, warships, uh, warplanes, atomic bombs don't count. They just decide the case based on the law of the sea. And that is the forum where we are on equal footing with China, despite uh, China's military strength, overwhelming military strength. When you go to the court in uh, UNCLOS, yes. you're on equal footing. So on the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, why do we have, why do you believe we have a strong case? Well, we have a strong case because uh, under the Law of the Sea, uh, a state can only claim uh, maritime zones from their land. That means from your coast, you can claim 12 nautical miles, territorial sea, 200 nautical miles EEZ, and an additional 150 nautical miles extended continental shelf if you can prove a natural prolongation. So at most 350 nautical miles from Hainan. Right. That's Mischief Reef is uh, over 600 uh, nautical miles from Hainan. Uh, so China is claiming, in fact, the entire South China Sea. And under UNCLOS, you cannot claim an entire sea. You have to base your maritime claims from your land. You yes. measure it from your coast. Now, the nine dash lines are not measured from China's coast. China doesn't explain where, from how it drew those lines. China hasn't given the coordinates for those lines. They just say, basta, we own it since 2,000 years ago. Uh, that's not UNCLOS, because right. when UNCLOS was negotiated, uh, many countries claimed the 500 nautical miles, 600 nautical miles, to some claim only 200, some 12. So there had to be a compromise, and uh, a compromise was struck. And this was the reason why we have UNCLOS, because there was this big compromise. Everybody agreed that all coastal states will have 200 nautical miles exclusive economic zone. China actively participated. China, in fact, led a group of 77 countries uh, in certain issues. So China knew about this compromise, and that compromise meant that 
everybody gets 200 nautical miles, but they have to waive all other historic claims to all other waters. Correct. You're just entitled to 200. And you waive everything else so that there will be stability in, in, in the oceans and seas of our planet. Now China is saying, yes, we are entitled to 200 nautical mile EEZ, but we also claim the entire South China Sea because of historic rights. Right. I mean, they cannot do that. We already all agreed that all historic rights are extinguished. When, when UNCLOS was signed, historic rights were extinguished and everybody had a 200 nautical mile and a possibility for an additional 150 nautical mile if you can prove a natural prolongation of your continental shelf. That's all. Yeah. You cannot claim beyond that. But China is claiming the entire South China Sea. And it's the only country in the world that's claiming the entire South China Sea. In this legal case now, we're coming to a critical juncture in it. What is at stake? What happens if the Philippines wins or loses? Um, even the fact that China's not participating in it actively. If we, the issue here is whether the Philippines will keep 80% of its exclusive economic zone in the South China Sea or will lose it to China. 80% of our exclusive economic zone means we will lose the entire Reed Bank if we lose this case to China and uh, maybe half of more than half of Malampaya will be part of the Nine Dash Lines, encroached by the Nine Dash Lines. We will lose uh, Scarborough Shoal, the waters around the, beyond the territorial sea. We will lose uh, Macclesfield Bank. These are our traditional fishing grounds. Right. If we lose 80% of our EEZ in the South China Sea, that means we lose 80% of the fish we catch annually in the South China Sea. So we lose the fish, we lose our gas resources, and remember, Malampaya will run out of gas in 10 years. So it will we have... should develop the reed bank. But the reed bank is totally encroached, mm -hmm. and every time we send a survey ship there to do surveying or drilling, China, the Coast Guards of China, will harass our survey ships. That's why we have not been able to do the surveying and the drilling. So it's massive economic impact on us. Uh, China, though, has not, a, has not participated in this case yeah, at China all. China said they will not participate, but they submitted a position paper uh, before the tribunal. Uh, China said we will not participate, but here is our position. And uh, they basically question the jurisdiction of the tribunal, saying that they have made a reservation not to be subjected to compulsory arbitration when it comes to sea boundary delimitation. But if you go to the exact provision of UNCLOS uh, on sea boundary delimitation, it refers to overlapping territorial sea, overlapping exclusive economic zones, overlapping continental shelves. Now, the Nine dust lines, the waters enclosed by the nine dust lines, do not represent territorial sea okay. because we don't know from where the lines are drawn. The waters are not EEZ waters because we don't know from where the lines are drawn. Also, the waters are not continental shelf waters. In fact, China said the waters of the enclosed by the nine dust lines are sui generis, one of a kind. Yeah. which means they are not territorial. The reservation under UNCLOS where a state can declare that it doesn't want to be subjected to compulsory arbitration refers only to disputes on sea boundary delimitation, specifically articles on territorial sea, overlapping territorial sea, the articles on overlapping EEZ, and the articles on overlapping continental shelf. So China cannot invoke this because the situation of China is different. The waters that they claim encroach and prevail over EEZ are not EEZ waters. They're right. not territorial waters, so not continental shelf waters. If the Philippines wins this case, who would impose it? Well, uh, the, the uh, UNCLOS, which all the disputant states ratified, including the Philippines and China, says that uh, the decision of the tribunal shall be final and binding okay. on the parties. And the parties are expected to comply with the ruling in good faith. That's the, the law, international law. But China said that they will not uh, comply. They will ignore any adverse decision against China. So uh, assuming that uh, the nine dust lines are struck down by the tribunal, what will the Philippines do? Okay, uh, We have to go, uh, go back to precedence. Okay. In the case of Nicaragua versus the United States, 
Nicaragua sued the U.S. before the International Court of Justice because the U.S. at the time mined the waters of uh, Nicaragua, yes. dropped mines there, supplied arms to the Contras in the Civil War, and uh, Nicaragua sued the U.S. Mm -hmm. for violating its territorial integrity. Uh, the U.S. said to the International Court of Justice, the International Court of Justice has no jurisdiction over this, and the U.S. will not participate and will ignore any ruling. The ICJ, uh, International Court of Justice, said, we have jurisdiction and we will make a ruling. And they ruled that the U.S. violated the territorial integrity of uh, Nicaragua, okay. violated international law. Eventually, the ICJ said the U.S. must pay damages of $30 million. So Nicaragua won. The U.S. refused to honor, to comply. Nicaragua went to the Security Council because it's the Security Council that will enforce the decisions of the ICJ. Okay. Of course, the U.S. is a permanent member. It yes. vetoed it. So Nicaragua went to the General Assembly, sponsored a resolution that U.S. must comply with international law, that the country that is, claims to be the number one exponent of the rule of law must comply with international law, comply with the ruling of the International Court of Justice. The resolution was put to a vote, of course, uh, Nicaragua won, and the U.S. lost, but it had a big major minority that supported it. So after several years, at the last resolution, only one country supported the U.S., Israel. Okay. So it was costing the U.S. tremendously in terms of, uh, in, of reputation. It claims to be the exponent, the number one advocate of the rule of law, and yet, it was glaringly in violation of international law. And the world was telling the U.S., you violate international law. Eventually, there was compliance in How a long? way that uh, saved the face of the U.S. The U.S. paid. Yes. And uh, Nicaragua was happy. Okay. Once the threshold is reached, when they feel that it will cost them more not to comply than to comply, then they will comply. Over an average amount of time how much would you well say? it could take uh, maybe 10 years a but uh, we should steal ourselves this, this will be a long struggle this this is not okay so okay. i was going so china itself though is also using this same well this issue is stirring up nationalistic sentiments there's a new leader in china how do you see this playing into the mix and whether or not china cares about international opinion well we have to understand that all the generals, admirals, uh, the Politburo members, all the diplomats of China, all their bureaucrats were taught since they entered elementary school up to college that they own the South China Sea under the Nine Dust Line. So we have to change that mindset. Okay. And we need a ruling from impartial, an impartial international tribunal, authorized, uh, even uh, allowed by China, because China is a signatory, to make a ruling. Yeah. And if there is a ruling, we, we will use that ruling to ask the world to join us in convincing the Chinese people that they cannot do that. And I think eventually they will listen. But it, takes, it will take time. We have, this is a long-term struggle. I, I call it an intergenerational struggle. We, this generation must lay down the foundation. We must get a ruling striking down the, the nine dash lines. And uh, the next generation will campaign uh, with the world and uh, to convince China. Like it or not though, this time around has a little bit, it seems to me at least, to have a little more at stake because you have China and the United States, the two, two world powers, two shifting geopolitical powers. The likelihood of how this will play out and accidents, for example, what is the likelihood that it could, before the legal process reaches some kind of conclusion, that it, it could flare into open conflict? Well, uh, as far as the Philippines is concerned, we know our limitations. We cannot afford to engage China in a war or even in a skirmish. But the Philippines brought the United States yes. in. Yes. Now, with respect to the U.S. and China, they have what we call, they have adopted the the code for unintended encounters in the sea, okay. the cues. And uh, that has worked. And both China and the U.S. know that uh, a war in the South China Sea is not to their benefit. For I mean, true. it's not worth a war for either of them, but it's worth for the U.S. 
to prove that there is freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. The U.S. does not take sides in the territorial disputes, but there is another dispute, the maritime dispute. Correct. And here, our position converges with the U.S. position that a nation cannot claim an entire sea. So you, you don't see the potential for military conflict? Very low, very Even minimal. if it's an accident? If there will be a skirmish, there will be an accident, they know how to control it. Some analysts have said that the Philippines fell into a, a trap, a strategic trap by China, and that the U.S. is close to doing that by China essentially um, drum rolls and then some kind of military action is taken in the case of Scarborough Shoal, a Navy cutter was brought in and then after that China comes in with overwhelming force and then claims the entire thing because you're the aggressor first. Well, if, if you look at it uh, as a tactical, uh, 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 tactical action, China is actually waiting for other countries to make a little mistake and then counter with a huge reply and grab the territory. But that is a tactical yes. action. Yes. If you look at the long-term strategic uh, yeah. action of China, you know that they are out to control the entire South China Sea. If you look at their actions since 1946, they have moved. Whether we like it or not, yes. that is Absolutely. the direction yeah. of China. Let me ask on the political front, the Aquino administration was the only one that has brought this case to, to court. 2016 elections, there are three countries that are affected that will have elections, the Philippines, the United States, and Taiwan. Um, set to win in Taiwan is uh, somebody who may exacerbate uh, Taiwan-China Taiwan relations. How do you see the politics impacting this area? Well, uh, the next president will take over in June of 2016. Correct. The case before the UNCLOS will be decided by March of 2016. The one country you haven't mentioned yet is Japan, the Jiaoyu Islands. Well, what Japan role? also is for the freedom of navigation. Correct, correct. Yeah, because they export and import a lot, and it, all their imports and exports passes through, almost right. all. So on the big picture, you see all the nations aligning all the against nations China. Aligning against China, because if China is able to claim the entire sea, or well, almost the entire South China Sea, what will prevent other countries, other naval powers from claiming the entire seas facing their coast, then it will be the rule of the naval canon, no longer the rule of law. And uh, I don't think uh, we want that. I don't think any other country wants that. Thank you Thank so you. much. We've Thank been you. speaking with the uh, Senior Justice of the Philippine Supreme Court, Antonio Carpio, on the Nine Dash Line, the, the upcoming decision at the South China Sea. I'm Maria Ressa. Thank you for joining us.